Okay. The following interview was conducted with Albert W. Overhauser, the Stewart Distinguished Professor Emeritus of Physics for the Purdue University Oral History Program. It took a place on Tuesday, April 13, 2008, in his office in the Physics Building. This is part two of the interview, and the interviewer is Catherine Marquis, the Oral History Librarian. Welcome, and good morning, Dr. Overhauser. Thank and you. Thank you. Well, can, um, we were talking at the end of the last one on the Overhauser effect, and if you had anything additional that you wanted to add to that. Well, didn't I say enough about it? Well, if you think of anything that, can, that you want to, it's really... Uh, I, I can't remember what I said the other day. Well, I think it's, it, it's really made a great impact. And whenever people, they associate it with you, and you were a graduate student when you really came up with that, right? At no, I, was it Illinois? No, was it that, Illinois? Was, post was after that? Postdoc. Postdoc, okay. At the University of Illinois, Urbana. At a very young age, though. In your early well, 20s. It would be a normal age. After all, I'd spent two years in the Navy sure. during World War II. Sure. That, that slowed my education down a bit. Uh, but that's still kind of nice. Um, talk a little bit about your recent work that you've been working on, the theory of CDW and the SDW mixing. That's not my recent work. Oh. I've been working on th that for 40 years. Okay, okay. Are you still working on it then? No. Okay. Uh, Any particular projects that... Uh, well, could you tell us a little bit what that involves for the researchers? Well, let's see. I have a picture over here. Okay. Yeah. Uh, a simple metal is, is one where you have a lot of conduction electrons. They carry the current around. And uh, uh, a really simple metal, the conduction electrons have a constant density a constant number per cubic centimeter uh, irrespective of where you are in the crystal. But a, a spin density wave or a charge density wave is a, is a spontaneously broken symmetry of this translational symmetry I just tried to describe. And uh, I invented both of those ideas way back in the 19... 50s, and uh, I, I th a third of of all my publications in my life has to do with this type of broken symmetry, a, a spin density wave or a charge density wave. <coughs> Looking at this picture, uh, the d different shadings. Say these are electrons with s electrons have a spin; they have a magnetic movement, and the spin can be either up or down, <laughs> relative to some axis you choose arbitrarily. And so, if the density of the spin up electrons is, is one of these and spin down electrons is the other shade then if you add the two things together you, you just get a, a constant total density but if you add the up spins and subtract the down spins you, you end up with a, a spin density wave which is oscillating in, as a function of space and the first application of this idea that I d took was to the metal chromium. It turned out <coughs> from experimental results that chromium has a large amplitude in the spin density wave. It's sort of analogous to what I'm showing you in this picture. But most of my work has been focused on the really simple metals, which are the alkali metals. There are five of them in the periodic table of the elements. Lithium, sodium, potassium, rubidium, and cesium. Now, this, the simplest of those five metals is, in fact, potassium. And the reason for that is that lithium and sodium sort of disqualify themselves because many of the experiments 
you wish to do on these metals have, have to be done at very low temperatures, close to absolute zero. And lithium and sodium undergo a crystallographic transformation when you cool them down to low temperatures. Mm -hmm. and that destroys the, the ability to have a single crystal, which is what you want. Uh, potassium doesn't have such a transformation. And so, and rubidium and cesium are very hard metals to work with. They're very soft, very chemically reactive. And so are the five simplest metals, the only one that is truly simple is potassium. And I've, potassium is, is theoretically is so simple that every good theorist should be able to predict its properties. But th that turned out not to be the case. Here I have a, a list of 30 anomalous properties of potassium metal. And th they, they go back from to, to all the way back to 1963 to 19, 993. These, these dates are the discovery, experimental discovery dates of these of this anomalous, these various anomalous <coughs> behaviors. And uh, so I began trying to explain these phenomena. No one else could explain them. They, they violate all the textbook descriptions of a simple metal. And, and so I've, <coughs> together with my co-authors, I've published approximately 65 papers explaining all these crazy Phenomenal. properties. Yeah. Uh, one way I like to put it, I may have not said this the last time, was potassium is to metal physics what the hydrogen atom is to atomic physics. Okay. Good point. And um, the world doesn't like <coughs> these phenomena. In fact, if you if you uh, look up a, a standard monograph on metals, potassium is never mentioned, even though it would... It's the easiest one to work with, right? Yeah. Well, no, oh. it's, it's just that they, they can't explain its properties, yeah. so they pretend they don't exist. But th th these phenomena were all discovered by extremely talented th experimental physicists. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have a textbook that was written a long time ago by Harold Hall. He's a British physicist, and he that's the only book that I know of, but he devotes five pages to my work on potassium. And uh, the people who write, wrote reviews for the book sa said it was a, it's a great textbook, but it's spoiled by the five pages he <laughs> wrote about my work. <laughs> and uh, 18 years later, he came out with a second edition, so I quickly went to the library to see what happened to those five pages. And yeah. You can guess, he, he, he eliminated them. <laughs> yeah, I agree. So that... Mm -hmm. that, that sort of spoils science in a way. After all, science is <coughs> based upon what you you observe, not on what you wish to be the case. Right. Exactly. And so I'm I'm in the process of <coughs> putting a, a book together uh, so that uh, all, all my work on the simplest metal will not be lost forever. Good. good idea. Good move. Hopefully it will be published by John Wiley. Is the book finished or are you still working on it? Well the book essentially, essentially aside from an introductory chapter will be a, a 
book of uh, the 65 reprints. Oh, okay. It's like a compilation, a collation, a compilation. Of yes, uh -huh. but o only of the <coughs> work that I, I personally have been involved in. Very good. It's not. Uh, it's, it's not a, re uh, a monograph that presents all the work that has been done in the alkali metals, because that would take a whole library, I think. <laughs> For many years, it was a very popular subject, but n now. Nobody uh, talks about potassium anymore, mm. except me. <laughs> okay. <laughs> mm. And doc, uh, for the record, Dr. Overhauser gave a lot of talks, 10-minute talks and lectures, and also within the state of Indiana. And his they're very well documented in his Vita, which of which we have a copy with the oh, researchers. Yes. Very nice. Uh, I list all the places where I've given right. talks. It's very extensive. Uh, I, I, I never kept a record of the titles. But it's nice, you know, and not only in, in the United States, but outside as well. Oh, sure. All right, okay. <clears throat> um, talk about family. Do you have a wife and children? Did any of them come to Purdue? The answer to all those questions is yes. <laughs> okay. I'm married. We have eight children, four girls and four boys. And... Uh, or any of them, did any of them follow you into physics or science? No one became a physicist. One of our daughters went into uh, biology. Okay. She got her PhD here at Purdue. Uh huh. She got her bachelor's degree at, at I believe, in University of Wisconsin. Is she? We have. We have, we have does she, is Two she boys in research, who graduate the biology? Is she in research or does she teach? Oh, she was in, involved in research for many years. But uh, her, well, her husband became a professor at, at, in the medical school of the University of Tennessee. Mm -hmm. So when, when they moved to the Memphis area, uh, she took a job working for some pharmaceutical companies that make artificial knees and hips, and so she represents that company Good. in that area of orthopedic surgery. Mm -hmm. We have Stephen graduated from Purdue, and David graduated from Purdue, and um, then I mentioned that Joan received her PhD from Purdue. Mm -hmm. Do any of them live locally or within Indiana? Paul, our oldest boy, uh, is an attorney. He. I think he graduated from Purdue too, but as a result of taking a, some of his <coughs> courses, he became interested in he in, in law. And, and when he graduated from Purdue, he went to the Indiana University Law School mm -hmm. and became a, an attorney. He has his own law firm in Greenfield, Indiana, mm -hmm. which is an hour and a half's drive from sure. here. Yeah. Well, that's nice. It's nice to have some sort of. It's nice to have a lawyer in the family. <laughs> yes. A <laughs> uh, um, couple of you. Uh, let's talk a few about your awards and honors. <clears throat> One of the. Um, you're a fellow of the International Society of Magnetic Residents. But talk about that Russell Varian Prize that you received. Well, that's awarded by the European Society for Magnetic Resonance. Okay. And uh, they have this prize. One of the big manufacturers of 
magnetic resonance equipment is very incorporation. It's is that is that a U.S. company or anything? It's a U.S. company. It okay. grew up in Palo Alto, California. Okay. And the Varian brothers were the ones who founded their company years and years ago. But a large fraction of the magnetic resonance equipment that's sold in the world is manufactured right. by, by this company. And so th they sponsor a prize which is awarded to one person per year for f fundamental contributions to the field of magnetic resonance. And uh, I was chosen to be that recipient <laughs> last year in 2009. Mm -hmm. Where was, what city was that, would you receive it at? Well, they have a big annual meeting uh, once a year. <laughs> and uh, and the, the, it's, it's a different, it's, 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 the venue, the p place where the meeting is held is different each okay. year. It was in Gothenburg, Sweden last year. The prize has only been awarded seven or eight times. and. Uh, had been in France and been in London. I think it's going to be in Florence this year. Mm. That's a nice city. <laughs> and uh, <coughs> did you have to give a talk as well? Is getting the well, I. They wanted me to give a talk, but not not a technical talk. They wanted me to after the banquet just to give an after banquet talk of 20 or 30 minutes on how I discovered what I discovered you know what what, what led up to the discovery and uh, so it was something that could be understood by everybody <laughs> <laughs> and it makes a nice evening event you know where sure. it up. <clears throat> how about the honorary doctor from Purdue that's very nice yeah, I have th the Purdue honorary doctorate, and then I have one, as you mentioned earlier, uh, from one from the University of Chicago, an honorary doctor of science, mm -hmm. then an honorary doctor of philosophy from Simon Fraser University, which is in, near Vancouver, B.C. Mm -hmm. it, it's, it's sort of the MIT of Canada. Did you have any affiliation? Have you been there at any time, or do you know? Well, you don't didn't receive any degrees from them. Did no. You? Okay. That's very I, nice. I had a one of my my best friends uh, who was with me for fifteen years when I worked for Ford Motor Scientific Laboratory. Mm -hmm. uh, he he left Ford a few years before I did, and he went to. Became a professor at Simon Fraser University, so I had a connection there. Mm -hmm. through Kept his in touch through his friendship. Yeah, very nice. How about the um, National Medal of Science awarded by President Clinton? How did you no, hear about it? I didn't. I never heard of the National Medal of Science. Okay. <clears throat> and one time I came home from a trip away from West Lafayette. And I had a message to to uh, call up somebody in Washington D.C. and I, I just assumed it was an invitation to s serve on a committee. Since I don't like to serve on committees, <laughs> I was sorely tempted to just ignore the phone message. But I finally broke down and thought that was not a nice thing to do. Well, it turned out the person who left the message was. Clinton's science advisor, and what he called about was not asking me to be on a committee, but to come to Washington, D.C., and, and receive the National Medal of Science. Very nice. So that's how you found out about it. Then, then you went, they have a nice ceremony, don't they? Yes. Mm -hmm. And you, do you get to uh, meet, you met the president as well? Uh, yes, I was looking. The ceremony when the medal was awarded 
uh, Clinton couldn't come to, so it was given by the vice president. Mm -hmm. But then <coughs> afterwards, we were taken over to the Oval Office and got to shake hands <laughs> with the president. Good move. <laughs> this is what it looks like, right? <laughs> like in the movies or in the pictures. Yeah. Oh. <laughs> oh. Couple of Purdue awards that are kind of nice that for the researchers, the uh, Herbert McCoy Research Award. Yes. Um, just for researchers, just mention a comment what what type of award that is. And they well, only they give one per year, don't they? The Herbert McCoy is just yes, given I annually. Think, I think so. Mm -hmm. Yes. I won that a long time ago. <laughs> it's very nice, though. And then you give usually you give a lecture as as a result of it. As part of the thing, I think. What I, mean, I see the announcements when they, it comes out, whoever's going to be getting it. And I mm -hmm. think there's a talk that sometimes you have to give. Well, they give the talk a year later. Mm -hmm. Oh, is that how it is? Okay. Well, no, is that how it works? I think it is. I think you're right. They, they have a banquet. Yeah. And I think the g person who gives the talk at the banquet is the one who won it the previous the year. Recipient for that year. Yeah. The previous year. All right. Okay. I mean. It's in the spring and the award is in the fall or something like that. Yeah, the see. announcement is anyway. <clears throat> um, you're also uh, with Sigma Psi and a Phi Beta Kappa, and you've been a member of the National Academy of Science for a long time. Mm -hmm. That's very nice. Yeah. Um, can you think of a, do you have an outstanding event that comes to mind? Something special? It doesn't have to necessarily be Purdue related. I don't think about outstanding you know, every, events. Every day, every event, every day is kind of an event. Right. Retirement activities. What have you been involved in since you've been retired? <coughs> well, one one event. Way on important. And, okay. and uh, when I was a postdoc, is when I dis <coughs> discovered theoretically the possibility of enhancing the polarization of nuclei by a double resonance technique, which is usually referred to as now as the Oberhauser effect. Most people didn't believe that was possible. They thought I was violating the laws of thermodynamics. But I had a colleague, a young assistant professor at the University of Illinois, who had his PhD in the field of magnetic resonance from Harvard. And I, I told him about this idea for polarizing nuclei in metals. The effect was just discovered sort of accidentally by me. If, if you disrupt the equilibrium of one part of your system, that will automatically <coughs> disrupt the equilibrium of other parts of the system because the two parts affect one another. And I, I just wanted to know what would happen if I upset the equilibrium of the conduction electron spins, what would happen to the nuclear spins? And I discovered that the, the enhancement of the nuclear spin polarization would be about a factor of 2,000 times larger than what it would be <laughs> otherwise be. And uh, Charlie Swichter was one of the few people in the world who believed calculation and the only way <coughs> you can check it is to do the experiment this required special equipment to be built where you could look at nuclear spin resonance and electron spin resonance simultaneously in the same magnetic field so he <coughs> decided to risk a new graduate student that he had to build this equipment and it, it took about a year and a half to build the electronic equipment that could do this experiment. But in the meantime, <coughs> I had to uh, find a, a permanent job. And so I applied to several places. And I was invited to give a couple of talks at Cornell University as an as a in interview visit. <laughs> and. Um, they decided to offer me the job they had as an assistant professor. And 
Margaret and I moved to Ithaca, New York in August of uh, 1953. And we'd been there about a week, <coughs> and the secretary left a note on my office door that I had a telegram in the, in the office that I could pick up. <coughs> Well, that scared me because in the 1950s you only got telegrams if somebody in your family dies. <laughs> so I was scared to go pick up the telegram, but I managed to do it. And the telegram, I here is it. This is in fact. Oops. telegram that came, that was in, I think, in July 1953, mm -hmm. and it was announcing the fact that they finally did the experiment, and that what I had predicted This is the original happen. telegram, researchers. This is the original telegram. Mm -hmm. This is just a photocopy of the mm -hmm. original. Very nice. And so, then that was a, a big event. Mm -hmm. All right, it should have, and it was. The, the experts in the field, of course, claimed it wouldn't work, that I was violating the second law of thermodynamics. But uh, what matters is what's the truth. <laughs> That's right. There you go. Uh, and, uh, any um, in closing, is there anything that I forgot to ask, or anything that you'd like to, uh, in summary, something that uh, I forgot to ask, or you want to elaborate on? I leave it up to you. You come into your still come into the office every day, almost. I try to. Uh -huh. Yes. Very nice. I work in, in various areas of <coughs> f physics that we haven't covered. Any, well, go ahead. Do you want to make any? Go ahead. Well, let me mention one other area and that Good. has to do with the vibrations of atoms in, in a solid, what would be called lattice dynamics. Okay. Uh, usually, when one makes a model of, to describe how atoms vibrate relative to their equilibrium position in a solid. He said they just consider an atom to be a, a rigid ball and they have make little put, at, put in springs that connect one ball with the other ball so that the force <coughs> that one ball exerts on the other, bar, other ball just depends on how you've changed the distance between the two balls. Well, that's a first well-known model for trying to do lattice dynamics. <coughs> but when I was at Cornell in the mid-50s, I guess it was, I, I decided that an atom isn't a rigid ball. It has a nucleus and and then it has lots of other tightly bound electrons. But then <coughs> there's a last filled shell of electrons which uh, can vibrate relative to its own nucleus. And I, so I call that the shell model. And uh, so it would be as if an atom were like a, a basketball but then, then inside the basketball there was a baseball connected to the uh, outermost shell by a s s set of springs. And then the, the s s forces between the two different atoms were controlled not be where the nuclei were, but where the centers of the, 
of the shells were because uh, when the, the shell vibrates relative to the other ones, uh, the overlap of the electrons from the two atoms uh, creates a, a force which tends to restore things back to where they ought to be. <coughs> well, it turned out that this model had an in incredible success in allowing one to explain. <coughs> Up until that time, nobody could explain the lattice vibrations of, say, silicon and germanium, which were very popular materials in those days because semiconductor physics was just being <coughs> invented. But I guess the only reason I bring this up is that the, the one paper that my graduate student and I published on this subject, Gail Dick was the student's name. It's the most cited, cited publication I have. You know, there's this citation index, and you can look up it right. and see how many times your paper has been cited by other people in scientific publications. And my paper with Dick on the shell model has been cited. The last time I looked, it was. Um, 1,637 times. <laughs> and, uh, Super. So, so it's the most cited paper, but it is certainly not the most important. That's a compliment. It's very nice. Any of, do you know if any of your other papers have been cited? Did you ever check on some of the other ones, too? Oh, you go you through the list. Oh, you, okay. You, you should do that. Many, many thousands because I've published 190 papers. Yeah, right. Yeah. But the, uh, the original paper on the dynamic nuclear polarization, I think, is has only been decided half as often as the shell model. Mm -hmm. Where is the graduate student that co authored that paper? Is he uh, in academia? Is he teaching, or is it a he or a she? Well, he, he went to uh, University of Illinois as a postdoc, mm -hmm. and then after that he joined the faculty at the University of Utah in Salt Lake City. And he's been there all his life. He's been head of the physics department. He's been dean of the School of Science. He's been vice president for or research. I don't, I don't know if he's ever been president. <laughs> By now he's retired. Uh -huh. uh, but he liked to ski. That's a good spot to be in. <laughs> That's a good spot to be in. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. Oh. <laughs> yeah. I, I didn't keep track of uh, citations. I, but it's, it's nice to have that available so that you can check things and it, uh, it works out well. Yeah. Mm. Any other particular area that I didn't uh, mention it, that you wanted to any area or do you think we've got pretty well covered? I mean, we don't want to forget anything. Well, well, you know, some discoveries take longer than others. The, 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 I, the idea for the gravity experiment using a new neutron interferometer that only took me two hours to dream up that <coughs> that idea. The work on dynamic nuclear polarization took me two days. The, There's a the, the variation. The work on the shell right. model with Dick it took me roughly two years, but my work on potassium has. It's taken 40 years, so there's a, a wide spectrum. There's a wide spectrum of h how fast ideas bear fruit. Right. Right. Yeah. And you, you mentioned earlier about your book, but that is coming out. Has it gone to the publisher? Will it be coming out soon, the one that you just completed? Well, they're still trying to decide how to reproduce the reprints. Oh, okay. I was hoping they would just photograph them or... Uh, 
as if you had a PDF file for each one. Uh -huh. But they want to reset everything uh, to meet their artistic standards. And so, since the 65 reprints occupy, for, I wrote it down somewhere, oh yeah, 486 pages. It's going to take a lot of work yeah, on their part. Get, that's to, right, on their end. <laughs> on, the, on their end. Right. To reset. 486 pages. Right. Right. I'll have to have a book signing then for that. We get, I get a complimentary signed copy. Is that right? <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you, Dr. Overhauser, oh, very much. For, very, very nice. I appreciate that. I got a little